Well, welcome. That's really loud. Welcome in the name of Jesus, whether you are here or joining us online, uh, we welcome you. I'm Pastor Joel Pancoast, and um, it, is, it is a good day to be here. It's a hard day for sure, but as we're gathered here, we're gathered to worship, to proclaim Christ crucified and risen, to remember before God our brother Jim, and to give thanks for his life. And finally, we'll commend him to our merciful Redeemer and comfort one another in our grief. So as we, as we depart from this service, I know most of you here are, are aware of this, we'll go in and we'll go into the air conditioning and uh, appreciate some, some refreshments together. Know that all of your emotions have their place here. So whether you're celebrating Jim's life and the promise of resurrection with joy or mourning his loss, or anywhere in between, all of the feelings that we bring here, we, you can bring them and give them to God. Trust in God's promise and baptism that Jim was and is claimed by Christ forever. Hear God's word of promise, both for Jim and for each of us, and rest in the sure and hope, sure hope of the resurrection. As we begin our service Hear God's promise given to Jim and to each of us in the gift of baptism. Paul writes in his letter to the Romans, that when we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. As we remember that promise, that we, all that is Christ's is ours in this promise of God, we sing together, give me Jesus. Uh, the words for you here are in your bulletin, and if you're joining us online, you'll find the words projected on the screen. Just about the break of day, just about the break of day, just about the break of day, give me Jesus, give me
Friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of grace, God of glory, we remember before you today our brother Jim. We thank you for giving him to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ so that we may live in confidence and hope until by your call we are gathered to our heavenly home in the company of all your saints. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Friends in Christ, grace and peace to you. I want to start this time with a reading from Luke's gospel account, a story that, that some call the story of the prodigal son. Now, often when people hear this story, the, the natural thing to do is to, to locate ourselves in it, to, to try to figure out who am I? Am I the older son? Am I the younger son? Am I, you know, where am I? What do my behaviors or, or my life say about who I am? As natural as it is for us to focus ourselves on the story, today I want you to especially hold back, if you can, from that kind of judgment. And, and instead, I want you to first focus on the character of the father and his behavior. So first, a reading from Luke, chapter 15. Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So the father divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had, and he traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his field to feed the pigs. He would have gladly filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off, and he went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him, and he was filled with compassion. He ran, and he put his arms around him, and he kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and he approached the house, he heard this music and dancing, and he called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. The slave replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. This son became angry and refused to go in. So his father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, 
you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be, Thanks be to God. So it was just over a year ago when some of us gathered for the funeral of Laverne, Jim and Susan's mom. And I went, met, when I met with uh, some of the family here in this church building, I think Jim had made a comment something like, wow, I'm surprised this place doesn't burn down that, when I come in. In one sense, I think Jim considered himself a prodigal, at least the way that, that he understood and the way that many people understand that word. Jim was a private person. He was pretty independent. He was a joker, even if the, the jokes always weren't fit for the audience. Just in the last few weeks, it's like everything that happens, the family keeps saying, that's Jim, even the wasps here. <laughs> when it came to church life, I think he considered himself a prodigal, which is why he said the kind of thing he did, you know, about, about not, you know, wanting me to stand too close to him or thing, you know, things like that. Well, Jesus tells this story about a son who went to his father and he said, Father, give me my inheritance. Give me everything that would belong to, you, to me if you were dead. And then this son went on his way, he lived his own life the way that he wanted to. I think sometimes Jim thought of himself as a prodigal. He grew up in church. Susan told me that he played the guitar for Easter worship when he was younger. <laughs> as Jim grew older, he didn't frequently enter a church building. And unfortunately, I think a lot of times many people think that means that that faith isn't important to him or that they're not a good Christian. Well, you might be surprised that as a pastor, I would say that you don't have to go to church to be a quote-unquote good Christian. I'm not sure that any of us could live up to that anyway. Those kind of requirements and expectations and judgments that we put on people defy a God of grace, a God who created us, and all things out of love and continues to show that love whether we quote unquote go to church or not. Those kinds of requirements and expectations, they always have good intentions. Going to church, being part of a supportive community that's centered on God's word, it is good and it does, it helps me as a person see how God's grace is active in my life helps me remember that God loves me even when I don't deserve it. But I think Jim would also, I think I'm pretty sure he would appreciate what my grandfather used to always say, that the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? Jim was, as some of you defined him, unapologetically himself. Zach, I think you said that. He did his thing. He enjoyed life on his own terms, and he did enjoy life. He was independent. He could even be a little bit bullheaded, even if it meant relying on a friend to help him break out of the hospital since they insisted there that he needed to have a driver to leave the hospital. But he was certain he was well enough to drive home. Early in life, maybe he wandered a bit. Don't we all at some point? But Jim knew who he was. Jim knew that God loved him. He knew that God had blessed him with family and friends and gifts that he shared with others. After a time of wandering in his younger years, Susan, I think you shared that he realized just how important family and relationships of belonging were. He showed it. No matter how messy his apartment was, may have been 
I've been told that he always had pictures of his mom and of you guys, Josh and Zach, of his family displayed prominently. He spent as much time as he could with his family, especially around holidays. He called them regularly. He hardly ever missed sending a card or making a phone call or being there on a birthday. Last year at his mom Laverde's funeral, I shared that she had a spark of adventure and humor. And at one point in her life, she told Jim, do you remember what she told him? This is, I know, I'm scaring you, right? <laughs> I don't know if you told me this or if Jim told me this, that she, she told Jim, you accidentally turned out okay. <laughs> she was right. She was right. I don't know about the accidental part, but that he turned out okay. Jim was who he was, and unapologetically so, but he had a heart of gold. He could be stubborn, maybe a little bit too direct sometimes, but he was steadfast. You knew what you were getting, and you knew where you stood with him. Apparently, his friends even sometimes had to let him know if he was being a little too direct or harsh or maybe inappropriate for the occasion because he thought he was just telling it like it was. But sometimes to someone who had never met him, they didn't always hear it the right way. He never intended harm. He was just, as you said, unapologetically himself. But he had this circle of friends and family, and they are what mattered to him. You mattered to him. You mattered to him. He lived his life the way he wanted, even, but he was reliable in his care for others. My experience of Jim was, was that he thought he was a prodigal to church. But if you agree with that, you might be surprised that what this parable that Jesus told really means. This prodigal, the word, this characteristic that people often give to that younger son in the story isn't as much a characteristic of the son who wandered from his father, even if he did squander all of his inheritance as, as much, it's not a characteristic of him as much as it is of the father. See, prodigal isn't a term that defines any of us, really. Both prodigal means extravagant. Some people could even hear it as wasteful, depending on your perspective. Both of the sons, I think, are like, every one of us in some way. The younger son recklessly spends his inheritance without much thought of the father. The older son resents his brother because he has remained, fa he, this one, has remained faithful to his father, and yet his brother still receives his father's generosity. But I think, but think about the wasteful behavior about this father. No matter where the son goes, for that matter, no matter what either of these sons do, the father's love is always there, and it's running out to meet them before they even arrive home. All that is mine is yours, the father said. That's the kind of God we have. The love that we give thanks for today, both for Jim and also for each one of us, because none of us are perfect. We are broken. We are enslaved to worldly temptations. We have good intentions, but sometimes, maybe often, we don't live up to them. We rely on ourselves more than on the God who created us or on the people that God has surrounded us with. We turn away from God. We wander and waste the gifts that have been given to us, but nothing we do can lead us away from God. No matter who we are, no matter what we do, God runs out to meet us wherever we are. The story and this promise reminds me of, of maybe one of my favorite psalms. Psalm 139 is, is a reminder to each of us that God knows us, each of us, so fully 
for it was God who formed our inward parts. God was with us in the very beginning and God will be with us in the end. God created us purely out of love that never leaves us, never. So here, a portion of Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind me and before me. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. Even if I say, surely, the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them even as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try, not, I try to count them, but they are more than the sand. I come to an end, and I am still with you. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the children's book, The Runaway Bunny. Uh, uh, th there's this, this silly little story about a bunny who decides he's going to run away from home. But no matter where he goes, his, mother, uh, his mother's imagination meets his imagination. Uh, she loves him so much that she says, no matter where you go, I'll always come after you. If he, becomes a if he becomes a bird, his mother will be a tree for him to come home to. If he becomes a boat to sail far away from home, his mother will be the wind that will blow him where she wants him to go. Finally, after many, many attempts to let his mother know that he's had enough and he'll do anything to run away, the little bunny says, then I will become a little boy and I will run into your house. To which his mother replies, then I will become your mother and I will catch you in my arms and hug you. It's, uh, it's a, a metaphor, a, a parable for Psalm 139 where the psalmist says, where can I go from your presence? Where can I flee from your spirit? Everywhere I go, you're there. Even when I run, even when I try to hide from your presence, even when I don't act like others think I should, you are always there. And while some may hear that as a threat, <laughs> you know, hearing God as one who hems me in, this is a promise. Jim knew that promise, and he knows it so fully now. As we hear at the end of the psalm, I come to the end, and I am still with you. God has been with Jim his entire life long, and now Jim is fully wrapped in God's arms of love. So I want to share one more scripture. It's a little bit shorter one. But it is powerful. It's a powerful uh, few verses from Paul's letter to the Romans. I had chosen to read this text before I realized that I had read it a year ago at Laverne's funeral. And Susan shared with me that it was one of her favorite verses, sets of verses. So listen to what the Apostle Paul writes about God's promise that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Paul writes, 
What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us, will he not also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who will indeed intercede for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, our distress, our persecution, our famine, our nakedness, our peril, our sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through the him, through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the, God, the love of God in Christ Jesus. We're here to mourn because this... This death comes too early. It's unexpected. And yet we hear that even in this promise that nothing can can separate us from the love of God. And Paul writes that we are conquerors, more than conquerors through him who loved us. And, and And we look at death and it doesn't sound like a conquering thing and indeed it's not. But in Jesus Christ... God overcomes the darkest, the worst, the most difficult, whether it's something in our lives or even death. He overcomes it. In a moment, we will commend Jim to God's loving arms, a love that has pursued him his whole life long, a love that always runs out to meet him even before he had a chance to recognize it. Some people would call this love wasteful. To some, because of how far it will go for all people, even death on a cross. But remember that, those words from the Father, all that is mine is yours. And that's what we remember today. We can't help but mourn, but as we mourn, we rest in this sure and certain hope that the resurrection of Jesus is also a promise that we will receive, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing, not even death. So I invite you now in this time to join me in professing the Christian faith. We'll profess the faith in God, a Father, Jesus Christ, a Savior, the Holy Spirit, the the redeemer the sanctifier and we'll say that with the words of the apostles creed again those words are in your bulletin and if you're joining us online you'll find those words on the screen i invite you to join with me i believe in god the father almighty creator of heaven and earth i believe in jesus christ god's only son our lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the res- the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to join with me in, in a few prayers. I'll have a few petitions and end each petition with the words, God of mercy, and invite you to respond, hear our prayer. And then I will end those prayers with the Lord's Prayer and invite you to join with me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity for us to gather on this day to mourn, to celebrate your servant, Jim. 
We give you thanks for the gift of baptism through which you forgive and you cleanse us of our sins. You give us the promise of eternal life. Give courage and faith and hope to those who mourn so that we may cast all of our sorrows on you and be provided strength for the days ahead. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and yet walk as, by, as yet by faith that where this world groans in grief and pain, your Holy Spirit may lead us to bear witness to your light and your life. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Help us in the midst of things that we cannot understand to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection to life everlasting. God of mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace, we give you thanks because by his death, our Savior Jesus Christ destroyed the power of death. By his resurrection, he opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also and that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come will be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus. God of mercy, hear our prayer. God, we come before you now, and we ask that you give us words. Teach us to pray as your Son and our Savior taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us commend Jim to the mercy of God, our maker and redeemer. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Jim. Acknowledge, we humbly beg you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of all your saints in light. Amen. Oh. Okay, I didn't see that. Do you want me to flick them away? There you go. <laughs> That's Jim. Holy God, holy and powerful, by the death and burial of Jesus, you're anointed. You have destroyed the power of death and you have made the holy resting, made holy the resting places of all your people. Keep our brother Jim, whose ashes we now lay to rest in the company of all your saints. And at the last, O oh God, raise him up to share with all the faithful the endless joy and peace that's won through the glorious resurrection of, our, of Christ our Lord, he who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
in a sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to Almighty God, our brother Jim, we commit his ashes to its, their resting place, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. May the Lord bless him and keep him. The Lord's face shine on him and grant him mercy. The Lord look upon him with favor and give him peace. Amen. Rest eternal, grant him, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon him. We sing our sending hymn. It's in the bulletin, I want to walk as a child of the light. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Let us go forth in peace. Amen.